Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering submersion injury of the pediatric patient. Now, before we even get started, the last video I did, which was in increased intracranial pressure, and I was talking about posturing of the pediatric patient, I made a mistake. I corrected it in the description box, but I want to make sure everyone is clear on this. So I'm going to talk about this just to make sure that you understand it, just in case you didn't read the description in my last video, and then we'll get into the submersion injury. So let's take a look. This is why I have the page open. So <clears throat> the two posturing that is very important. You have to know those two posturing. You have your decorticate, which is also known as a flexion posturing, and you have the desper, you guys know I can't pronounce Desibrate, which is also known as extension posturing. This is correct. Now, where I made the mistake in the last video, I mentioned that the decorticate is the most dangerous one because that's the one that involves the brainstem. And I absolutely was mistaken. That's why I took all of this and I put an arrow over here. This is correct. It's the desibrate, the desibrate posturing. That is the most dangerous one. That is the one that involves the brainstem. So I do apologize because I misspoke in uh, my previous video when I was talking about the posturing. And again, I have the correction up in the description, but I know not everyone reads the description. So for this entire chapter that I'm doing the teaching, <clears throat> excuse me, on um, disorders involving the brain, I'm going to mention it in every video just to make sure that everyone's clear, okay? The, the corticate is still uh, uh, flexion posturing, but that's not the most dangerous one. The most dangerous one is the desiderate, also known as extension posturing. That is the one that's most dangerous. The prognosis is the worst because it involves, it involves the midbrain, all right? All right, now that we got this cleared up, now I can go over to submersion injury. And before I even get started talking about submersion injury, guys, please, if you appreciate the content that I'm trying my best to deliver to you guys on a daily basis, I'm going to ask you to please help support me and help support my channel. You can help the algorithm going so that it shows up on more people's pages, which will help support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already, engaging with myself and other learners in the comment section. Let me know what you liked about the video, what you'd like to see more of. Maybe you have a resource that might help somebody else engage in the comment section and share my video if it's possible, share it through text message with a friend or share it on your social media platform with a coworker, maybe a nursing instructor or a classmate that will really help support my channel. So I appreciate everyone who's been helping me and supporting me thus far. And I ask you, please continue to do so. So without, <coughs> excuse me, guys, without any further ado, so let's get started. Look what it says. Submersion injury, that's what we're talking about. The term near drowning is no longer used. Instead, we use the term submersion injury. And that should be used until the time of drown, uh, excuse me, should be used until the time of drowning related death. Now, some, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Submersion injury can take place in any body of water. Children less than the years of age, they're most likely to have a submersion injury in a bathtub where top heavy toddlers fall first into a pail of water and they're unable to free themselves. So let's stop right there. What the children who are doing the toddler stage between about one to three years old, they got the big heads and the small bodies. What does that mean? That means when they're running and let's say they see a body of water and they want to stop. When they stop, remember they're top heavy. What happens is they go head first and they may not have the strength to pull themselves out and that may cause a submersion injury, okay? Preschoolers are at risk for injury in swimming pools and school age children and adolescents are most commonly at risk in natural bodies of waters, such as lakes, ponds, and rivers. Take a look at this nursing alert. Look at this word right here. Remember guys, whenever you're studying and you see words such as all, always, never, only, pay attention. It's important to know all children who have a submersion injury should be admitted to the hospital for observation. Every single one of them. 
Although many patients do not appear to have suffered adverse effects, complications such as respiratory compromise, cerebral edema, that's that brain swelling, can occur even 24 hours after the incident. That's why it's so important, no matter who it is, if a child had um, a submersion injury, they need to go to the hospital to be observed. Therapeutic management. With rapid treatment, some children can be saved. Resuscitative measures should begin at the scene as soon as possible, and the victim should be transported to the hospital with maximum ventilatory and circulatory support. The first, here's something else, guys. When you're studying and you see first or primarily or, or priority, pay attention. It's important to know. The first priority is to restore oxygen delivery to the cells and prevent further hypoxic damage. All children who have submersion injuries should be hospitalized for observation. Well, this is this is interesting. This is something else you guys got to pay attention to. Let me tell you something. When you're studying and you see that the author already said something to you in the table, they already said something in the box or a diagram or a figure or an illustration or a nursing alert, and then they take the time to put that same thing that they already told you in text, that's important. Most likely you might see it as a test question. Why do you think they're repeating it twice? They're not doing it just for the heck of it. It's so important. They want to, to repeat that information to make sure it sticks in your brain. All children who have a submersion injury should be hospitalized for observation. Although some children do not appear to have sustained adverse effects from the event, respiratory compromise and cerebral edema can occur within 24 hours after the incident. In the acute recovery period, fever should be prevented, although prophylactic antibiotics are not recommended. So we want to make sure that patient doesn't develop a fever, but we're not going to give them antibiotics without them having signs and symptoms of infection. We're not going to give that prophylactically. Aspiration pneumonia is a common complication that occurs about 48 to 72 hours after the episode. This is what's known as a dry drowning. Patient almost drowned. You thought they were fine. And then two to three days later, they they pass away. This is what's known as the drown, the the excuse me, the dry drowning. Okay. <clears throat> and let me back up because this aspiration pneumonia, let me, because these are two different things. So <clears throat> The dry drowning, that's when that patient basically is, um, aspirates on the fluid that um, got into their body when they almost drowned. Now, this aspiration pneumonia, let me ask you something. Are you ever supposed to have fluid in your lungs? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But what happens is when that patient almost drowned, they ended up getting fluid in their lungs, which you're never supposed to have. What happens with a body of fluid in the body that's not moving or somewhere it's not supposed to be, bacteria starts to grow. So the patient can start to have, um, they may develop what's known as aspiration pneumonia. They have pneumonia infection in their lungs from the fluid that they aspirated from when they almost drowned. Okay. So that's your aspiration pneumonia. Let's talk about prognosis. The best predictors of a good outcome are the length of submersion. So obviously, guys, the more amount of time the patient was submerged, the worse your prognosis is going to be. And the less amount of time, the better the prognosis is going to be. So the best predictors of a good outcome are, are the length of submission, less than five minutes, and the presence of sinus rhythm, reactive pupils, and neurological responsiveness at the scenes. Those are three things we absolutely do want to see. Nursing management. Nursing care depends on the child's condition. A child who survives may need intensive respiratory nursing care with attention to the vital side, mechanical ventilator, ventilation or tracheostomy, blood gas determination, chest x-ray, IV infusion. Look at this. This is important. Nurses often have difficulty relating to the parents if obvious neglect has precipitated the accident and subsequent problems. It is important for those who care for these children and their families to assess their own feelings about the situation in addition to assessing the family's coping abilities and resources. And guys, this is a common theme across nursing, across the board. Before you can effectively care for your patient, and since we're dealing with peds, also the family members, especially the parents, you have to confront your feelings and your emotions about the patient, the family, and the situation itself.
and anger, hostility, aggression, bias, any feelings that can hinder you caring for that patient, you have to not only recognize it, be able to put it aside, okay? Prevention. The most common cause of submersion injury in infants and young children is inadequate adult supervision, including a momentary lapse of supervision. This means that an adult, a responsible adult, must have eyes on that child every single second because all it takes is a second for submersion injury to happen. All parents and swimming pool owners should be familiar with basic CPR because rapid basic CPR is one of the keys in improving outcomes. Words such as keys, essential, cornerstone, important, those are very important words to know. Like when you see them, when you see them when you're reading, Read, read that sentence again, whatever it is that they're talking about, because it's important for you as a nursing student to know what they're talking about, okay? So teaching all parents, people who own swimming pool CPR, those are keys to improving the outcome. Because remember, guys, one of the keys to improving outcome is that patient getting CPR as soon as possible on the scene. Water safety and survival training should be required for all school age children. Pool covers and fencing on all sides and the presence of lifeguards can prevent accidents. And guys, that's your submersion injury in a nutshell. Let me know what you thought about this video. This was a very short video, but to the point and everything you need to know is right here. Let me know what you thought about this video. Please don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And I have a free live review coming up Saturday, October 30th, 2022, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So just check out my channel for more details. Pass that on to anyone you know that is graduating soon or they've graduated and they're studying for their board. So I'm going to be going over priority and delegation. I'm going to continue from my last session. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.